Hello and welcome back. Okay, in my last video I showed the simple clone of the classic game Snake that I had written to demonstrate some of the functionality of the processor, especially the new UART circuit I added over here. And the reception on that video was absolutely awesome, so thanks a lot for that. But one request I, I had multiple times was for a bit of a tour around the, the source code and show you what I did and how I did it. Okay, I picked this game for a few very simple reasons. The game itself has a few basic challenges in it which are quite interesting from a programming perspective. But overall, the complexity of this game is at a level where it was plausible to finish it in a, a fairly short space of time. So from that regards, it made a, a pretty perfect demo. Okay, I won't get too entrenched in playing this. Let's have a think about what the interesting challenges in programming this game are. Now firstly, people expressed interest in how I had done the simplistic graphics and the colour knowing that I only actually had a serial port output to a terminal. So I'll take you through that in a moment. Collision, even in a simple game like this, is an interesting subject. And for many games you need a source of random numbers. It was only used to place the heart objective in a new location each time you ate the previous one, but uh, you still need a decent source of random data to be able to do that. And lastly, how you're going to track a tail from a snake which is going to be variable length is an interesting programming challenge which isn't immediately obvious how to do it, particularly to a lot of new coders. So a few people have been asking me about that. Okay, now the way I was able to produce some basic graphics and colour was with the use of ANSI escape sequences. Now, whilst you're only outputting text, there are certain strings of text which the terminal programs or the old physical terminals were designed to interpret differently than just text to display. And so what you've got is a series of operations which can change the behavior of the display, move the cursor around, or indeed select some colors. So most color-based displays have this basic 16 color one. There are extensions for more colors, but they're less commonly supported. And this was all I needed to do to get a fairly decent looking snake game on the screen. But predominantly, I used the color selection, I used the cursor positioning, the ability to remove the visible cursor from the screen so I didn't have that flashing around as I was trying to update things was quite important. But basically, position cursor and change color was all I really needed to get the game this far. I did also use a special code to change some lines to 40 columns rather than 80 because that just gave me closer to square characters which made the game a bit simpler to draw. For the main splash screen image, what I actually did was I drew this in a paint program. Mostly it was cobbled together from little bits of clip art online. I actually paid for a couple of these images, even though they were degraded heavily by the time they made it in. And then with some text on top. So this created my splash screen image. And then I wrote a program on the PC which looked at vertical pairs of colors in this image and turned that into characters with the correct foreground and background color. And I used a special Unicode character, which is just half background and half foreground to create a simplified rendition of this image. Now the terminal defaults to 80 by 24. So this image is 80 by 48. And it came out looking quite nice, as you can see in the videos. For the rest of it, like the level you play on itself and all the, the other messaging, what I did was I also stayed on the PC and wrote code to generate all of these different elements of the screen. So here, for example, is the code necessary to set the background to black, the foreground to red, and then output the Unicode character that makes the little heart symbol that I used as the pickup objective. And so this piece of code can both output to a terminal for me to test it and see what it looks like, but it also outputs a data definition compatible with my assembler for me to copy and paste into the program code. 
So here is that piece of data I just showed you. I added a zero on the end to terminate the string. But then if I need to display the heart, what I do is I issue the command necessary to move the cursor to where it needs to be. And then I simply do my, my UART write function, which is a string output passing this in. So I've got similar ones for the segment. This one, score prep, moves the cursor to where the score is displayed, sets the foreground and background color appropriately, and then I just have to output the number itself. So I've got ones for the green segment, the crash, which is a preparing to draw it in red. For the tail segment, I've got one for drawing in black, but you'll also see here I've got a commented out one for drawing it in magenta. So you can probably guess from that there was a while where I had a bug in the code where I was trying to work out where I was overwriting the tail. And so I just had to swap this over and I could see where I was, uh, where the code thought the tail was as opposed to where I could see it was on the screen. So in these big ones are the big graphical images. So this splash is all of the data necessary to draw the fairly nice looking splash screen at the front. And this entire thing, I just draw with a single write command. Same for filling in the level, my game over text. I know some people might think this technique is a little bit of a cheat, but actually game development is very much a case of finding the simple ways to achieve things that, that look reasonably nice. So uh, no apologies for, uh, for using this approach. It was very much a case of this got me where I wanted to go as quickly as, as I could. Okay, collision. The size of the console is 80 by 24 characters, but the control codes I send for setting up the main level selects double width characters for all but the first line of the screen. So I've actually got this kind of 40 by 24 for the main level. And what I did for the collision is I just created an off-screen buffer, which was going to be one byte per cell, and that encompassed the entire screen, including the boundary. So I had a zero wherever it was safe for the snake to go, and I put in a one for all of the solid boundary. Now what I also did was I added a bit of data on the end. Now this was the additional bytes necessary to round the entire buffer up to 1024 bytes which is a nice round number from a programming perspective. And that was useful for a couple of reasons that I'll uh, get to later on. So then what I would do is when I had a snake in progress, I would be writing data into this byte array for the positions where the snake segments were. And then obviously if the head came around and hit part of the body, I would know about that because each time I went to move the head, I would read the pre-existing cell location and I would know if I was hitting a wall or a piece of the snake or indeed the special number I was using in that data to denote the heart which you're trying to pick up. So with this 1024 byte buffer, what you've got is quite a simple situation where you know the X and Y location you want to check, and then the offset into that buffer is simply Y times 40 plus the X coordinate. Now 40 is made up of two binary bits if we look at it from the simple method we used for binary based multiplication in the relevant programming video. And since these are powers of two, we can do that with some fairly simple shifting. So we start off by shifting the Y up by three, then add to that the same value shifted up a further two times, and then we add the X, and that's our address into the buffer of the cell we want to look at. So this central play field was 38 by 21, but I used complete screen addressing for the storing both the position at the head, the tail, and anything else I was looking at. Just made it simpler that way if the screen and this collision array were all dealing with the same coordinates. Inside the code, what I had was just this get grid location function that you passed in the X and Y location that you were interested in, and it would return the address in memory of the one byte for that particular cell location. So you can see here is the sequence of shifts. Now what you will realize is it's a 1024-byte buffer, so sooner or later I can initially just do 8-bit shifts, but then I have to switch to doing 16-bit shifts, which are two sequential 8-bits. In this particular case, I've actually switched to 16-bit shifts one step before I absolutely had to, because when I first wrote this code, I was allowing for the possibility that maybe I would have a taller screen, and so 
a Y position over 32 would have necessitated the extra shift in here. So I could save a cycle from this, but uh, it's not worth going back and changing now. So this is the initialize function I used for setting up. So what I ended up doing here was just directly writing the start position in then very much a lot of this stuff like the directions, the status of the player and the score, I'm just all initializing to zero. You see, I initialized the tail location to the same location as the head of the snake, but then I'm storing a value for the length and I'll explain why I did that in a little while. But then the bulk of this code is actually just going through and I'm, I write 80 ones in and then a series of ones and zeros to construct the overall shape of the level in that buffer to start with. Now placing the heart objective requires some random numbers and random numbers are always an interesting subject in computer game development or indeed computer science as a whole. There are a number of really hacky ways I could have done this. I could have actually just embedded into the code a fixed list of heart locations, which would have been kind of a poor way of doing it, but uh, you wouldn't have known any difference looking at it. But to make the game interesting, that buffer would have needed to be quite big, and I didn't want to do that. And I've also got uh, more uses for random numbers in some of the code I'd like to write in the future, so I thought it was worth writing a standalone random number generation library. What I implemented was a modified form of what's called a linear feedback shift register. Now, I will provide a link to the Wikipedia article in the description for this, because if you're interested in basic random number generation, that's a good place to go and look. Although there are vastly more things you could read on the subject. Here is the diagram of a 16-bit optimal linear feedback shift register. Now, this image I've taken from the public domain image on Wikipedia. But this basically shows you've got 16 bits and what would be referred to as four taps in this. So there's four points where the bit field is sampled. So each time I want a new random bit, we shift the shift register along one, sample four locations, do three exclusive ORs to combine them, and then stick that remaining bit back on the end to fill the space we've shifted out. And that's our random bit. Now for each different length of register, the best possible sample locations have been calculated for every rational length and different ones require different numbers of sample points. If you're happy to not have as good quality numbers or as long a random number sequence before it repeats, you can, uh, you can get away with a simpler configuration if the code warrants it. And that's what I did. Now firstly, I wanted to generate 8-bit random numbers, so I didn't want a shift register where I was calling it eight times to generate one bit at a time. So what I've actually done was implemented a 16 byte field, which basically has eight channels of this all together. So then what I've done is initialized it with some offline generated random bytes. And so what I do each step is take one byte off the end, combine it with two others, and then stick it at the start in the, in the newly opened location. So I've got two exclusive ORs, and this produces some fairly competent numbers, but the I don't have the full set of taps that are necessary to do it properly. But there are a few ways I can kind of um, improve the results I'm getting from this. I basically, uh, I wrote a basic Im implementation of this in C++ initially and just tested it. And I determined that to get some decent numbers out of this with a half guessed at um, sample offsets, I needed to add one and add a couple of extra shifts into here, here which mixed the eight separate shift register channels that um, we're running in parallel within each byte. And that kind of made up quite a lot for the weaknesses of the basic implementation. I went with three samples rather than four samples simply because of the register restriction I've got in my architecture. Whilst I could quite easily have done more, the uh, once you run out of registers, things tend to slow down a bit. And so I was prepared to compromise on the, the results just a little bit for, for speed. Let's have a look at the implementation of that. So I've just got um, 17 bytes in RAM, and then I've got uh, in ROM, I've got this initialization table, which is my kind of pre-seed data to, to fill the, the RAM table up with. And so what I do is in this initialize function is I just copy these 17 bytes, including a zero for this position value. 
into the RAM location and then that's the system initialized. Now the important thing to realize here is rather than moving 16 bytes each time I want to sample the shift register, I maintain this as an offset and so I simply increment the offset and then modify all of my lookups into this table by that offset, which is why I used the value 16 so I could use a, a simple bitwise and to clamp numbers into that range and make them wrap correctly. So then I can um, handle what is essentially a 16 byte shift. I can do it with just a, a single increment operation. Now this code to sample it, particularly now I'm using a larger font, um, looks a little bit bigger than I was hoping for, but the vast majority of these are single cycle operations for me in this processor. So this is actually still very quick. So I load in the position, increment it, and it by 15 and write it back out. And then I've got uh, these two offsets for the taps, exclusive or the results together and return it. Now, one thing you always want to do when you write a random number generator is give it a bit of a test to make sure the randomness is sufficient for your purpose. So the test I used on this was to write a quick loop which I ran on a 256 by 256 image and I ran this 256 squared times. So I basically set a random located pixel to a completely random color. And this was the result I had. That actually looked pretty good to me. Now I will admit that when I used some different tap locations, I actually had a distinct pattern in the, in the end result, which is bad, but uh, that's why I wrote this test. So I tweaked the numbers a little bit, got this result. And whilst I wouldn't like to claim this fulfills any particular standard of randomness, like you might want for a cryptographic algorithm, this visually looks very random. And when you're developing computer games, if it looks random, you're probably ticking all the boxes. So now all I had to worry about was how to place a heart in a random location here. And you've got a few considerations here. You need to not be placing it anywhere where there's a wall, or I'd be actually overwriting my collision data. I need to not place it on top of the tail. And I need to find a completely free spot in order to uh, to place that. Now the first thing to realize is whilst this is the 40 block wide data table, that's just the representation of the 1024 bytes. So I could just as equally look at it as a 32 by 32. But the way I actually chose to think about this was simply as a linear array. We've got 1024 locations and I want to find a location in there where the data contains a zero. So these walls are all one. Other elements of the game might have different values, but the empty spaces that are free to receive the heart are a zero. So the algorithm here is actually very simple. I pick an index between zero and 1023 by taking two 8-bit random numbers and masking off bits and oring them together. Actually need to Put that shift in here. Now in the code what I'm actually doing is putting this into the low 8-bit register um, and then I'm doing this in the high 8-bit register so this shift doesn't need to exist but uh, just needed to fix that. And so I pick a random location and then I sample that byte out of the collision and if it's not zero I just loop back. Now this is potentially not the best way to do it but it was a very simple way to do it to get this game up and running. And the reason why it's not necessarily good is at the moment, this code is going to return a valid value very quickly because the vast majority of collision cells are empty. As the tail gets longer and longer, you're going to have more and more cells that are not valid locations. So this is going to loop more and more times. Potentially, you're going to get to a point where there's only one empty location to place the heart and you're effectively throwing random darts at the board when there's actually only one result you can get. So if I was writing this to be a little bit more robust, I'd um, spend some time double checking what the maximum runtime of that is and I'd possibly write code for handling these cases a little bit neater. Okay, the last challenge to look at is how we actually track the tail because as the head of the snake moves around, we are raising the tail such that as the score increases, the tail gets longer. Now, I was thinking about a few different ways of doing this. 
The thing that first jumped to my mind when I was uh, considering what I'd do was to construct a FIFO, probably with a circular queue, such that I would have a variable length list of XY locations of the tail segments. Now that kind of circular queue, I'm actually going to show you a hardware implementation of and explain how that works for the buffer in the UART. But I actually realized there was a much simpler way of doing the tail for the snake game that didn't require any additional memory, which is always good when you're trying to uh, fit stuff in as small a space as possible. As I explained, what I did is as the snake head move, I would read in the cell it was about to move into to see if there was anything special, such as a wall or the heart or a tail segment. And then I would fill in an appropriate value into the, that collision cell so that I would be able to reference it and detect a, a self collision later on. What I actually realized I could do is write into this cell twice. So I initially write an arbitrary snake value, but then as I'm moving the cell on, I rewrite over the top the direction of the next snake cell that I'm now putting in. So then what the tail erasing code is doing is it merely has to store the location of the end of the tail as it currently exists. And so that would be this location. It would read that byte in, move to the tail location indicated by that direction, and then overwrite the old location. And no matter how long this tail gets, I'm not consuming any more memory than this base one byte per cell collision data. And I thought that was a pretty elegant way of doing it. And it's actually the first time I've used that technique. And it only really occurred to me when I was, I was thinking about the complexity of implementing this in assembly language in a fairly tight environment. And so my suspicion is actually that this was probably at least one of the ways that the early implementations of Snake did this, because I think it makes more sense than the the techniques that occurred to me when I was programming it on systems with uh, much more memory and performance than you actually need to implement a game like this. So here's the snake update function, which will save the position back into the appropriate location once the direction has moved. And then the update tail function will check to see if we're not extending the tail if it is, it just returns and lets the tail grow one step longer. But the player tail location, we're definitely going to delete if we make it past there. And so I do the set position, output the overwrite, get the grid location, which is the offset into that collision data. So we can read that in, overwrite it with zero, and then move in the right direction using this direction table which is just a quick little look up for the X and Y modification for each of the four directions. Now I'm sure you don't want me to scroll through all of this code. So that's the, that's the interesting sections covered, I think. Okay, well, I hope you found this breakdown interesting. The next uh, few videos in the CPU series are gonna be dealing with converting this pipeline section into PCBs. Now I'm very used to the majority of people watching these videos being fairly long time subscribers to my channel, but I know that there is a bunch of people in the analytics at the moment who aren't subscribers. So you, know, if you're finding this stuff interesting, it'd be very nice if you uh, went and hit that subscribe button and uh, it would be great to have you here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.